pretty, these were pretty decent results that we just had. Except for the first topic. And maybe we can try to make this method work even better. So the PLSI was one of the early methods and it was actually, I think, quite uh, quickly superseded by a method called latent Dirichlet allocation, which is still the go-to method for topic modeling these days. LDA, not to uh, be confused with linear discriminant analysis, but this is latent Dirichlet allocation. There is latent in here indicating that we will be again be doing graphical model type of concepts with latent variables. There's something with Dirichlet in here, namely a Dirichlet distribution. And well, allocation is kind of the way it, we are labeling. So in essence, this looks very similar to the model that we had from PLSI. If you would take this part, that's pretty much PLSI. So we have PLSI, but we added two variables in here. And that's actually scalar variables. So that's just two floats that we put in here additionally. Nevertheless, this makes this model both more complicated and more powerful. Both of these are prior variables, this ha meaning I'm currently not learning them from the data. But the user has to choose them. So two additional parameters. The problem with these is the naming is quite inconsistent. I've given a table in the bottom how they are named. So in one of the earliest sources, we only had the prior on the left. It was called alpha. And there is at least kind of um, agreement that we con consider this parameter to be alpha. The parameter on the right-hand side, eta, as it appeared in the earlier works from David Bly, then when people probably didn't figure out what, the, what it is pronounced or so, ended up often calling it beta. Eta, beta, maybe this is just misunderstood or they wanted to avoid people misunderstanding eta and uh, making understanding beta. The problem is in the original work, we also have theta and beta. So they are very, <laughs> we have very similar names. We have beta in here. And the beta that we have in here then was often renamed to phi, probably based on the observation that theta is similar. And if you turn it around, go from rows to columns, and that is kind of the intuition that we have for matrix factorization. If we turn the letter around, <laughs> kind of the theta looks like a phi, at least a little bit. And, but in other cases, the phi is written this way. That's also a phi. So that is probably how the, this, this writing evolved. And then there are some cases such as this textbook that I recommended also for the PLSI and, and these parts. And I would also recommend actually for LDA. And it, that one uses uh, pi and theta, but theta for the other distribution. Probably by the way it was built up from earlier work that already used pi <laughs> for that. So be careful when reading these works. Don't blindly trust that the variable name that you're used to means the same thing in every work but different authors could use different names. Make sure, often you will find this type of diagram. And the diagram is probably the easiest way to check how the variables are named. And there will usually be some indication of what is a topic and what is a document in there, depending on how they are um, repeated. And then you should be able to disambiguate these things. But yeah, so if you're learning from different sources, um, that can easily get you confused. Now, LDA has a generative process. And now, in a way that we can theoretically 
make the model produce new documents. And that is primarily interesting to do if, um, if you have a pre-trained topic model and a new document. We can use th this observations then to infer the topics of a new document, whereas in the LSI in the beginning we could not. <coughs> Sorry. Now what has changed is that our topic distribution and our word distribution, word distribution of each topic, topic distribution of each document, they are no longer just randomly given. They are no longer magic that we get, but we assume that they follow what is called a Dirichlet distribution. And that is the name giving part for LDA because that is what we added. Everything else was already in PLSI. We will be looking at the Dirichlet distributions um, in more detail next. What it does give is topic distributions are no longer arbitrary, but there are plausible topic distributions that are more likely to occur, and there are unusual topic distributions that are less likely to occur. And the same holds for the word distributions. We have word distributions of a topic that are more likely to occur and some that are less likely to occur. Now, afterwards, we're doing the same thing. So for each word position in a document, the length of the document is kind of given by an oracle. We have to um, draw a topic. We draw the topic from a multinomial, and the multinomial is given by this topic distribution. And now that we know which uh, topic the word is from, we can draw a word from this uh, the word distribution. So we have the same integer indicator variable in here that gives us this topic number, and we could write this in more mathematically, more nicely, if it would be like a vector that has exactly one one in there, and then we have a matrix multiplication that would pick the um, distribution. We could also add something in here where we would draw the length of the document from a Poisson distribution on the typical document length. And we could then learn this parameter of the Poisson distribution. We, um, since it's not depending on the words, that's something that we can pre-compute. And then in the end, it turns out that this doesn't change much in the model. Kind of puts more um, emphasis on the documents that have a typical length but they have more words, so that is fine. Now, let's look at the Dirichlet distributions. And if you Google for Dirichlet distributions, you, you may quickly find this image, which is taken from uh, Wikipedia. It's public domain image, so it's easy to reuse, and that's why people reuse it all the time, and it's fancy, it's 3D, so that is what you see all the time. And this is a distribution over three dimensions. It's visualized in three dimensions, but like the y-axis is our output, our probability density. Our coordinate system is down here, and it's a simplex. We are drawing this distribution over a simplex because we are looking at distributions distributions over three um, values, kind of histograms of length three. And they always must sum up to one. So if you would draw these in a traditional way, it would be a coordinate system. And we can go to one in each axis. We cannot have the vector zero because it's not a probability distribution. All probability distributions must sum up to one. And that is why they lie on this triangle. 
the triangle that is spanned by the unit vectors. And the, an arbitrary combination of these uh, unit vectors that ha doesn't have a negative or a multiplier larger than one. So anything in this triangle uh, is possible. And now over this triangle, we want to have a probability distribution. So some part maybe here in the middle is more likely, some part over there is less likely. That is kind of a mess to draw in this type of coordinate system. But since all of this data is on this triangle, which is a flat surface, we can squeeze this into our regular plane. So we have like an actual coordinate system in the, down below of this. So the, the zero vector is down here. And then we have the vectors going this way. And this is the vector 1, 0, 0. And this is the vector 0, 1, 0. And this is the vector 0, 0, 1. Now, this point up here, it's not up there. It's actually a point down here that we additionally draw the probability of as a factor on this um, y-axis of this projection. So it's kind of tricky to understand the semantics of these plots. But once you figured out um, that we have this triangular base, um, it's actually quite nice. Now, these are different types of um, Dirichlet distributions. And the Dirichlet distribution has this nasty large term in here with these gamma distributions, the gamma functions in the beginning. And then we have this x to the power of alpha minus 1. So it's kind of non-intuitive exactly what is happening here. That's why we need to look at this. So this function here will always it assigns a probability um, to each histogram. How likely we are to observe this type of value, probability density. The values themselves will be small, the probabilities, because this is a continuous distribution but we have a density in here. And depending on the parameter alpha, we can get what is called a concentration um, effect. And if we choose an alpha larger than 1, we tend to get this peak in the middle that we are seeing in this plot that is the usual visualization of, um, of uh, Dirichlet distributions. But it turns out that, so we can mean that this, mean, that this concentration means everything kind of moves into the center of this triangle. And that's where the probability mass concentrates. The interesting part is the point exactly in the middle of the triangle, in here, that is the vector 1 third, 1 third, 1 third because it must sum up to 1 and be in between of all the unit vectors. That's like a uniform distribution. And we are not constrained to doing this with three histograms of length 3. We can do this with more, but then we can't plot it anymore. <coughs> so um, that's not what I would call a concentration, uniform distribution. It's more like the opposite. Hmm? So, uh, how many parameters does this distribution have? I would imagine k minus 1 for like the position in the triangle and then another one for the width of the entire thing? It has these alpha as a parameter. And in theory, that could be a vector. It could be a vector for every i. So there could be an i in here. And then you get the non-symmetric versions that we have in the bottom. There's maybe one in there that is symmetric. It's hard to tell by the, the way it was projected. Um, 
we will mostly be using a version where all the alphas are constant. But in the general case, this will be a vector, this alpha. It will have the same length as our histograms that we get out. So if you want to have topic modeling with 10 topics, we would have a parameter vector of length 10 in here. But most of the time, it will be set to the same value. Now, this is the case with um, an alpha larger than, than 1. So it is the, the, the way the alpha is chosen is interesting. And namely, if we increase alpha, and now I, I'm, I've chosen it symmetric. Um, the, if I increase alpha, it get, I get this um, peak in the middle. And it will slowly converge to only allowing a uniform distribution in this histogram. But that's not what we want. If I would put alpha very large, this would mean that I require the documents to be about all topics to an equal amount. I don't want this. Instead, I would argue that most topics are about few, uh, most documents are about few topics. And I can get this if I choose an alpha smaller than one. <coughs> Sorry, so something in my throat. And if I choose an alpha smaller than one, I get like concentration in the corners of this simplex. And I get a lower density in, on the area of a uniform or approximately uniform distribution. I still have much higher values on these sides. So it's more likely that a document contains two of three topics than containing all three of them. And now if I further increase the alpha, this gets more and more extreme. And because it needs to sum up to one, the plot kind of quickly escalates and becomes a mess to get this plotted and get this interpretable. So it makes sense to begin from the top part and go to the bottom part to, to make it understandable what is happening here. So based on this triangle, on this triangle idea, <coughs> sorry. sorry also for those that will be looking at the recordings because I'm not fast enough at muting. Um, so we will have less data points in the center if we have an alpha less than 1. Instead, what we want to have is more points in the corners, which is documents about a single topic, and some points on these sides, which are documents about two topics in this case, and later on. Two, top, two out of 10 topics. And that is, that is why what the Dirichlet parameter controls. Now we had two Dirichlet distributions. We had this on the documents, but we also had this on the words for each document. So we're using the same trick to say the there's probably not a uniform distribution over all words in our topic. But the topics have some words that they contain more often and some words that they contain less often. And that makes sense to the human. And we're kind of saying that's more likely to happen. That's a better fit. That's a better model if it has the property that some words are more often than others in my topics. That's a better topic and then a better model. So that enhances the, the, the quality of the model. Now, if I do this in 10 dimensions, where I can't give you a visualization of a nine-dimensional uh, uh, 
surface um, or a nine-dimensional diagonal hyperplane in a ten-dimensional unit cube. So what I, what I can do is show it as a histogram. And now I've chosen uh, 20 topics. And we have alpha, so this concentration, z to 0 0.2. And from this distribution, I can generate random histograms. So it's a distribution over histograms that Erich Lee. And now I'm drawing random histograms from this distribution, which is what I would be in the generative process. And of course, I'm more likely to get plausible cases and not likely to get a uniform histogram. And as you can see, I quite often, <coughs> quite often I get some histogram that has um, the, this type of peaks. And here I have few topics that are more likely to occur and uh, many that are not occurring. And there could also be well, maybe five that are more likely, or four, and maybe that's five again, and this is maybe four to five. But most of the um, topics are not in the documents. I have a lot of values that are close to zero. So this kind of produces sparse distributions which is a property that we want in a lot of cases and are also using with like softmax operations in neural networks and these. So that is desirable and using these um, Dirichlet distributions does, um, does a good job. These were symmetric ones. I can choose the alpha differently for every of the topics. So I could make a topic that is more frequent, more likely to occur and I could make topics that are less likely to occur. And there are heuristics that say, for example, I'm choosing the alpha i as 1 divided by i. So the first one would be 1, then 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0 0.25, and so on. And that would mean I can kind of artificially generate a bias that the first topics are more common, the later topics are less common. So what are the benefits of adding this to LDA? Well, it yields what is called a full generative model, because now we can also generate the topic distributions and the word distributions of a new topic. And that is beneficial for analyzing unseen documents. So it generalizes better to additional data. It has this penalty for solutions that have many topics in the same documents. They are considered to be worse, so we kind of push that model to um, produce the, the spot assignments and similar for the um, word distributions. And that is why it's sometimes considered to be less likely to overfit to the data. Because the, it's just not, certain solutions are not plausible that may be too biased towards a single document. Now, the Dirichlet prior has nice properties, and it's not that easy to replace, but you can replace it with certain cases. Oh, there's a mistake in here. I need to fix the additional m, the lower case this. So we have the property that con the conjugate of a Dirichlet and a multinomial, again, yields a Dirichlet distribution, which is an interesting property for solving the equations. And it means that we are kind of in a closed world of probability distributions. And we don't get a complex probability distribution. But um, we do some operations, and we still have the same difficulty. Because co combining multiple distributions can be a problem. And there are certain combinations that solve out nicely. And one of the combinations that works very nicely is the combination of Dirichlet and multinomial distributions. And that yields uh, that the LDA, while this is a pretty complex I, prior that we put in here, there, is still relatively simple to implement into use. 
And there's an interesting property. I could put the alpha to a very large value, which would like give this type of uniform um, concentration in there. Yeah, it's not really useful, but it has like certain uh, special cases in here. But um, we must be careful that this does not mean I can make like all distributions equally likely, but this uniform really means I'm like pushing it to, to make everything similar. So maybe I should on the long run just remove this from the slides. It's more likely to confuse people. Now, unfortunately, it's still pretty nasty if we go at in, in Mart level. So we add this Dirichlet prior to our distribution. That means we, in addition to what we already had on our log likelihood function, we have this unobserved value in there, this hidden, this, this probability distributions, and not just one of them, but for each document we have one, and for each topic we have these distributions. And because we don't know them, we don't know the word distribution of the topic, we have to integrate over them, over all possible distributions. Now, they are not all equally likely, but some are more likely, some are less likely. So we have to integrate over all these um, uh, theta distributions, and then we get these conditional theta based on the alpha parameter that gives us how likely this particular histogram is. is. And then we can add this over all possible histograms, which is an infinite number of histograms. So we can't do this uh, easily, but we would like to somehow solve this equation. Now, that is just for one document. For one document, uh, assuming that the uh, topic topics word distributions, that they are constant, so I have additionally the likelihood of our word distributions, given our eta. And then we get another integral over all documents in here. So this type of nested integral over histograms that are parameterized with a Dirichlet distribution is quite problematic. Now, to solve this, we would like to take the derivative and set this to zero, but um, there hasn't been any success on that side on the mathematics level yet, and there probably won't be unless we find some really new, powerful mathematical tool to solve these things, we probably won't be able to have a closed form optimization. Meaning that we cannot just estimate our parameters with um, like the mean or by counting as we did before. Before we could count how often does this would occur and that's our maximum likelihood estimator. So um, that would be converging quite nicely. But now we have to find ways to resolve this without having to solve the integral. So without taking the derivative to and setting this to zero. And that will be also part of the, of the next um, sections, but we still have some time. Now, this is not the, the final and the ultimate model but uh, several variations and extensions of this have been proposed. For example, we can draw and vary the, this, um, the prior assumptions. So maybe, maybe Dirichlet was nice because we can solve the equations, but is Dirichlet really what we need? Or do we need something more complicated than that? And that would be nice to do, but we need uh, still need some combination that is somewhat um, solvable to, to make this entire thing work. But um, there has been some publications in 2009 on why priors matter and rethinking LEA. So maybe we should choose a different prior than a Dirichlet prior. 
then we still have to predefine the number of topics. We have to choose our Dirichlet parameters now. And we have to, um, and we have to uh, do the, word, the document length. But so at some extent, we would like to learn the number of topics. And we would also like to learn our parameters, the alpha and the eta. For the number of topics, we can do this unsupervised. For alpha and eta, we usually will require labeled data, kind of cross-validating if the estimates are good or not. For learning the number of topics, we can do, for example, hierarchical topic models, such as the nested Chinese restaurant processes. So the, the motivation of a Chinese restaurant process is um, people come to a restaurant and either they know someone and then they join the table of someone they know. But if they don't know anyone, they open a new table. And then the next one comes and either he chooses, knows someone at the existing tables or begins a new table. And that way the number of topics can increase if something does not fit the existing topics well, for example. Um, we can do hierarchical Dirichlet processes. We can do Pittman, Yor, and Poisson Dirichlet processes. So there are very different um, variations. That, then we have correlated topic models. Um, we can do this on other domains than text, which is quite interesting to do. And we can also work then towards temporal embedding, so trying to combine uh, both um, the idea of temporal information in here. So maybe the order of document is not random, but if you think of the example with the presidential speeches, they do have time. So there should be an, a meaning to their order. The topics should change over time. So I want to have a model that can use this temporal information. And on the other hand, I can try to integrate the new ideas of embeddings as done by word to vec Bird, and similar things. So these, these are various extensions that have been considered. And there are, of course, hundreds of papers that propose um, additional ideas. <coughs> 